Hello, hobby friends. It's time for Assault Squad. These Jumbo Jetpack dudes were instrumental in developing my painting skills. I got these as part of my first ever eBay lot. As a fledgling painter, rather than strip the paint off, I decided that it'd be more fun to paint each one differently. I painted this one about a year after the other four, in the Emperor's Children scheme. It's going to be hard to say goodbye to this paint job when I strip it. Not this one. This one needs to go. I scoop them up and get out my anti-paint jar. Let's see what we got here. Once upon a time, that was clear purple liquid. Well, time for these guys to take a bath in pumpkin juice. I'm a little hesitant to drop them in, but hey, they gotta learn to swim at some point. Uh, whoops. Talk about shooting yourself in the foot. With my floaters in place, it's time to put a lid on it. Aw, look at them having fun in there. While my assault squad's getting assaulted with chemicals, let's break out the firstborn bits bin. Oh, wait, uh, just let me get the tripod around the lid. There we go. Everything here that is not red plastic is from eBay. And looky here, some assault squad guys. All in all, it looks like I have enough bits for three more members. To fill out the squad, I'm going to use the Space Marine Heroes miniature, along with this totally legit mint green jump pack. Okay, these are actually copies I made from an impression I took from a certain Blood Angels finecast model. For the fifth model, I'm going to build it from parts. Parts made of clay. Speaking of clay, here's the clay tray. Come to save the day. Both the original and the copies of these legs are going to be used. On to the molding. The original second part of this rubber mold did not come out too well, so I'm going to remold it. I spread Vaseline all over the surface of the rubber to prevent a rubber to rubber bond, except for where the part is. Can't forget those nooks and crannies. Then I pop the piece back in place. Next, I slice my almost measured component cubes and cut them in half. And in half again. It's important to knead only as much as you need. I take a small piece of rubber and jam it into one of the cavities. On the cast parts, I've had to recarve the back of the collar cavity a few times now. So I'm glad to get the reforming of the back of this mold out of the way. And you know what else is back? The back of the mold. Original flavor. I use this back to back the new back because I don't want to use extra rubber if I don't need to. Then I get to making the other mold. It's important to engulf the piece slowly like a slime engulfing an adventurer. That way, all of the detail is captured, much like a slime capturing an adventurer. Then I lift the clear lid so I can check that the rubber is fitting from underneath. Oh, and uh, I also molded this plasma pistol. Here, I have a jump pack that I want to duplicate, so I'm going to make a temporary mold out of some Oyumuru, a thermoplastic. I push the hot plastic over the pack until it reaches where I'd like the mold line to be. After the smooshing phase, I use a dull hobby knife to make irregularities in the plastic perimeter so the second half will line up better. I remove the part from the Oyumuru and then rub it with some lotion, I, I, I mean Vaseline, yeah, 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 Vaseline, totally. I heat up some old molds in a ceramic cauldron and get to the smooshing phase, the sequel. Being sure not only to cover the part but also the surrounding rubber. I rinsed the whole thing under cold tap water and then I got to demolding and this jump pack does not want to vacate the mold. Due to the design of the pack, I think a three-part mold would yield the best result, which I'm not doing. As a solution, I'm going to cut some slits to allow the mold to open up more. Time for clay. Oh, that's a little crumbly, isn't it? There we go. Because of the depth and detail of this mold, I have filled the half separately to ensure that every crevice is crammed with clay. It's a start, but I have to carve away a bunch of excess clay. Then I repress the halves together and start over. Each time, I get closer to the proportions of the final product. This trial and error process is why I'm glad that polymer clay has an infinite work time. After somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, I can attempt demolding. If I fail, I simply press the halves back together and try again. But this time, I got a nice looking cast. Now it's been a while, and my rubber creations are awaiting inspection. I think the new back of this back part mold turned out pretty well. And so did the front of the chest and the pistol. I make the second halves of those molds and demold them after waiting the appropriate amount of time. 
I'm really happy to have a mold of this Mark 10 chest plate, since I only have two or three of them total in my collection. These legs need to be reattached. I'm using a peg joint so I can test fit them, which is important for supergluing. In hindsight, I should have used plastic cement instead, since that would have negated the need for a peg and would have been easier to clean up as well. Though, I do prefer superglue when reassembling old loose fitting parts, like this chest section. Here's how the jump pack turned out. It's not amazing, but it's not bad either. I can salvage this for sure. But oh boy, is this going to be a lot of work. If you find cleaning up mold lines to be therapeutic, then you've got to try this. Slicing off all of the weird edges and protrusions to reveal flat surfaces is very satisfying to me. Good thing too, because uh, there's a lot of it. Because I had to guess how much clay to pack in, the mold separated by a few millimeters around the back, causing the cylindric thrusters to have a flat, uncurved section on the bottom. So my solution is to not look at them from the bottom. There are countless other sections that have to be cleaned up, including a vent that was leaning too far forwards, so I carved a trench behind it and bent it into its new position. At this point, the clay pack looks way better than the other one I made. I also have to do some cleanup on this torso, but unlike the jump pack, this one came out of a dedicated rubber mold, so it's way less deformed. After assembling the torso, I glued the crimson hips together and filled the seam line, or in this case more of a seam canyon, with super glue and baking soda. At this time, I would like to point out that knife safety is important. I'm cutting towards my fingers with a technique that minimizes danger while maximizing force. I'm also using a blade that has been dulled a little bit. If anyone's interested, I might make a hobby knife video in the future. Anyway, the torso's looking pretty good. Now, I don't always do this, but if I'm not sure about a pose, or I'm working on a second hand or non-plastic model, I like to install a peg joint at the shoulder of my Space Marines. Using some round bits from a Gundam plastic runner, these arms peg on perfectly. Next are the weapons. I clean up a clay plasma pistol, then check the polarity of some 1x2mm magnets with a magnetized arm. Whenever I magnetize, I ignore north and south, and just judge the polarity by already installed magnets. Then I glue on the head and shoulder pauldrons. Just like the arms, I put a peg into the jump pack just in case I need to remove it later. And it looks like later is now because I want to repose the right leg. Please, don't ever cut through something as thick as this unless you are pressing downwards onto a cutting mat. And even then, be careful. The only reason I'm doing this in my hand is because polymer clay is super easy to cut through. And also the knife isn't that sharp. I also cut the accordion hip joint off to allow more reposing freedom. Now it's time for some invasive surgery. Upon checking the armature wire I plan to use, I realized that I probably should have gone for a skinnier drill. Whoops. To increase adhesion, I crimped the malleable wire with my favorite pair of bent needle nose pliers. The cavity between the wire and the walls of the hole is a bit too voluminous for super glue to air dry, so I remove the wire still covered in super glue, dunk it in some baking soda, and reinsert it. There should be enough leftover glue in the peg hole to bond with the hardened glue on the wire. Then, a test fit. Look at that karate kick. Hmm, something's afoot with the pose of this foot. I know. I'll adjust it by completely severing it. Wow. Reposing is so much easier when you have a proper sized drill. Who would have guessed? Then I glue the leg in place. Then I glue the leg in place. Some quick carving on the thigh armor. Then I glue the leg in place. There we go. Swept back legs. Now that's the exact flying pose I was going for. To finish off the hip joint, I break out the milliput. I always find it annoying to use this stuff, because of the constant moistening I have to employ so it won't stick to my fingers or tools. That being said, it's not that hard to work with, and it's just as easy to sculpt before and after curing just as polymer clay is. I press in some grooves with my hobby knife. They're not immaculate, but they will do. While I have the milliput out, I roll up two pieces so I can make some jump pack straps. I've never before tried sculpting a large detail that wraps around a miniature before, on top of that, the milliput is quite fragile at this stage, and I'm practically holding my breath while working on it. It did start to come off, so I hit it up with a bit of glue to keep it in place. You could even say that the strap is... strapped down. 
The relief of finishing it was quickly replaced with dread, as there is a second strap in need of strapping. At times like these, you just gotta strap yourself in. And you know what's more fun than hand sculpting details? Doing it a second time! This guy is also an Assault Marine convert, and unless his jetpack is strapless, he's gotta get strapped. You know what? This is a lot easier to do when there are no arms in the way. Hey, it's been a while. Let's check in with the swim team. It's time to start the procedure. Let's start with the model that didn't need to be stripped because it already had the right paint scheme. Oh wow. I mean, I've stripped models many times before, but it's not usually this easy. And it's only been like a day. By the way, I'm using Super Clean to loosen the paint. All it took was about a minute and a half and this marine was done. On to the next one. Oh yeah, I forgot I put a peg joint in this one. Look at those clean boys. Forming a conga line, I see. This shoulder pauldron is so old that it's missing those pill-shaped holes along the edge. And this chonky plasma pistol has to be my favorite bit in the whole squad. Assault squad assembled! Now, this beaky has an eviscerator. I want the hero's guy to have one too. So let's make him a bigger chainsword. First, I need to pop the sword off. To lengthen it, I'm going to combine it with this other chainsword bit I have. But the eviscerator isn't just longer, it's also deeper. I only need about a millimeter, and this one mil plastic card should do nicely. The cool thing is that it's thin enough where it can be cut with scissors. Before I can attach it, I have to flatten the back of the sword. Next, I cement it on. I make sure to look at the sword dead on to check the orientation of the two halves of the sword. This is my last chance to make sure the sword is truly straight, and not just sort of straight. I run some thickened plastic cement along the seam to fill any remaining gaps. After waiting a few hours, I clip off the remaining protrusions and carve away, being careful not to cut into the sword's body. Then I scrape the surface flat and sand it smooth. Now that is a proper eviscerator. It's a little bigger than the standard eviscerator, and it absolutely dwarfs a firstborn's chainsword. I reattach it, and I think it fits pretty well with this marine's running pose. The other eviscerator is meant to be two-handed, and is missing the other arm that would be holding it. All I need is some armature wire to create a handle, and the look is complete. Every squad member has a pistol, so I strap a few holsters on. I even carved a depression into the sergeant's holster to emphasize the fact that it's currently empty. Not all of the models get a holster, but they do get pouches and grenades. The previous owner of this model cemented a pair of grenades onto the leg. I don't really want it there, but I can't easily get it off, so I lean into it with even more grenades. And while we're at it, let's cut off his kneecaps. A dot of glue, and I place a big old skull. What's more grimdark than skull knees? A few more grenades, and now this beaky sergeant has a grenade garter belt. But we're not done here. The leader of each space marine squad in my army needs to have a banner pole. I previously snipped off the rungs of this pole so I could make a mold of the top decoration. A piece of paperclip should make a suitable replacement. I think it should be about as wide as the jump pack. No need to measure this. Eyeballing's good enough. I clip it with my favorite pliers. Then I file the steel flat with a steel file. I also briefly sand it to increase future paint adhesion. I keep it off center while applying super glue. Then I twirl it into place so the glue will be evenly distributed. To make sure it's centered, I check it against the jump pack. When it comes to banner poles, I don't really trust plastic cement, as they have broken on me in the past. So I pin it with more paperclip. Mr. Clayman is also getting a banner pole. Yeah, I'm glad I made the backpack detachable. When I put a banner on these banner poles, I want the banner to be swept back by the wind. And since I have no more bannerless banner poles, I'll just have to make one. It's really fun to twirl this in my fingers. Before I install the pole, I'm gluing the jump pack into place. Can't forget about the banner pole topper. I was thinking of making this claim model double as a jump pack captain. So some further decorating is in order. This twisted steel wire should make for a nice decorative rope. I bend it into the desired shape, test fit it, and glue it in place. To hide the bend in the rope, I finished it off with a shoulder shield I copied from a Sisters of Battle kit. 
all of the modifications are done, it's time to start working on the basing. Starting with the Space Marine Heroes guy. His right foot's toes are molded as part of the base. Talk about planting your feet. Be warned, this is not a safe way to cut something off of a base unless you are using the same thumb pushing technique that I am. Note how little of the knife moved after the toes popped off. If the entire foot was part of the base, I would have used a different removal strategy. This guy's toes are also missing. I wonder how that happened. I drill a hole through the center so it will cut off more easily. But this foot is far too inland for my thumb technique to reach it, so I opt for a pair of high-end nippers to make the final cut. Because I'm impatient, I pin the toes with superglue and armature wire. A bonus benefit here is that the wire can double as pinning for attaching to the base. Finally getting to the bases, I want my models jumping off of rocks. So I put wads of clay onto metal floppy disk disks. This way, I can press stone texture into them without pressing a fingerprint on the other side. Polymer clay has an infinite work time, so I'm taking my time and having fun making all kinds of differently shaped stones. Here they are, fresh out of the oven. Now taking a look at... Oh. What's going on here? I swear these weren't like this when I put them in the oven. What I think happened is that the heat reactivated the adhesive on the rim of the metal plates. Okay, these mini mountains are looking pretty good. But they do have these little squares on the bottom. Luckily, cutting through polymer clay is like passing a knife through butter. Especially when those little squares look like the butter squares you see on top of pancakes. Man, I'm getting hungry. The mini mountains are ready. Let's glue them onto some bases. Before I do, I score a diamond pattern into the bases to increase adhesion strength. This is probably unnecessary, but I'm doing it anyway. Now, which rocks to glue down first? For some reason, I'm very particular of the composition of my bases, natural or artificial. That being said, this one looks good. Once I have the position, I trace it with a sharpie. Then I score more hatches. The sharpie ink shows me where to put the glue. Then I drill out the foot so I can pin... Uh, whoops, went too far. What is with me and mutilating feet today? Maybe if I smooth it over, no one will notice. I cut off the mountain tip and drill that out too. I install some paperclip and pin it to the mountain top. Some of the mountain is hanging off the side of the base, so I cut it away with my knife. Don't try this unless you are working with a soft material and have a sizable amount of experience. The next step is to ice the cake with a super glue glaze. When dry, I get to wet sanding. Then rinse and repeat until a nice smooth finish is achieved. On Sergeant Clay's base, I put a bend in the paperclip to attempt to give the impression that he is pushing off of the rock in mid-flight. This marine looks like he's in a landing pose, so I put him lower on the base. Eventually, I got smart and started trimming the clay before attaching the marines. I also figured out that if I bend the paperclip to a 45 degree angle, I can get a deeper, more secure mount in the foot. The rest of the basing process was pretty straightforward. Foam clay to build volume, sand to make it look sandy, and blue Mod Podge. Cause every base could use some blue Mod Podge. I finish up by fixing magnets to the bottoms of the bases with green stuff. Yeah, this is pretty much the only thing I use green stuff for. So, uh, before I got to the flocking stage, when I was at my local game store, I, uh, dropped a whole metal cake pan filled with fragile models three feet onto a hard floor. And just like that, my army became an airborne division. Anyway, I only got about four breakages in the whole army, including the one I stepped on. Luckily, the first of the only two breaks in this squad was an easy fix. The second is the hardest possible place to fix. Oh wait, that's not lucky. I ended up repinning the first sergeant with a better pin, and the second sarge got a super glue and plastic cement combo treatment. I was really nervous while fixing the fragile banner pole, but it turned out okay. Also, try saying fragile banner pole five times fast, it's pretty hard. One good thing I got out of this was the mini from the store's paint and take event. It's unpainted because I worked on something else. I did pay the event fee though, it's not like I stole it or anything. Since I have a new jump pack sarge, that means this guy gets promoted from clay sergeant to clay captain. Talk about saving money. Well, that wraps up my assault squad building adventure. All of these models are ready to be painted, and I'm ready for a sandwich break. See you later, and have a good one. Go Go Gadget Extendo Arm!